Good day, students. Welcome to part eight of the Algebra 2 Trigger Regents Review for January 2014. In this installment, we are going to be going over problems 34 through 36. All right, let's take a look at problem 34. It says, in an arithmetic sequence, A4 is 19 and A7 is 31. Determine a formula for A sub N, the nth term of the sequence. All right, so uh, when we're dealing with arithmetic sequence, in terms of an arithmetic sequence, the formula that we have, um, can the formula we can use is a n, the nth term formula, a n equals a1 plus n minus 1 times the common difference d. Okay, this is the only formula we can work with. Now, um, we have two pieces of information here that we can use to set up a system of equations. First piece of information is A4 equals 19. So um, with, in this situation, we have A4 equals 19. And that also tells us that N is equal to 4. OK? So when A4 is equal to 19 and N is equal to 4, we can set up an equation here. Let's go ahead and set up that equation. A4 is basically going to be what our AN is, is. so um, let's have AN is equal to A4 is equal to 19. So in this situation, if we plug it into this formula, we're going to have 19, which is AN equals to A1, we do not know what that is, plus N is 4 minus 1 times the common difference, which we do not know what it is. All right. Now in uh, A7 equal 31, AN is going to be A7. Uh, which is 31, and we also know that n is equal to 7 because that's the value of the index, n is equal to 7. With these pieces of information, we can also generate another equation. All right, that equation is a n, which is a7, 31, is equal to a1, which we do not know what it is, plus um, the quantity n, which is 7, minus 1 times d. Okay? Now, in order for us to write down um, an a, an nth term formula, we need to find a1 and n. Um, I'm sorry, we need to find a1 and d and then plug it into this formula to um, generate our formula. Okay, so let's write down a real quick note. We must find a1 and d. Okay? So let's simplify this uh, two equations that we have here. So this becomes, um, let's switch it around. A1 plus 4 minus 1 is 3. D equals 19. And then this one right here becomes A1 plus 7 minus 1 is 6 times D. 6D equals 31. So we have a system of equations here. Uh, we can solve this by elimination, substitution, or graphing. How about we use elimination here. Now, which variables are easier to eliminate, the a1s or the d's? We can see that the a1s already have the same coefficient, so it's easy for us to eliminate a1 by simply multiplying the second equation by negative 1. Okay? So if we do that, we're going to have um, a1 plus 3d equals 19. The second equation stays, uh, the signs just change. Okay, so it becomes negative a1 minus 6d equals negative 31. Now that the a1s are opposites of each other, we just combine downwards. The a1s cancel out, so we'll have um, negative 3d equals uh, 19 minus 31 is negative 12. Divide both sides by uh, negative 3. And our final answer, d, is equal to 4. All right, remember we must find d and a1. So now let's go ahead and use this information to find to find um, a1. Okay, so to find a1, we're going to plug in this value of d into any of these equations. Let's use the equation on top. It doesn't really matter the one you pick. Let me pick the one on top. So to find a1, we're going to use the equation on top, a1 plus 3. Now instead of d, I know that d is 4, that's the result we got earlier, um, equals 19. So let's go ahead and simplify this. We have a1 plus 12 equals 19. 
um, then we uh, subtract 12 from both sides, you have A1 equals 7. Now we have A1 equals 7, and um, D equals uh, 4. Now we're ready to generate the equation of our form the formula for our nth term. Okay, so let's rewrite what the formula is. Again, it's a n is equal to a1 plus n minus 1 times d. Now we're going to use a1 to be 7. d is going to be 4. And n, guess what n is? n is simply going to be n because we're looking for the nth term. It doesn't specify the uh, particular term we're looking for. We're looking for a general formula that always works, okay? So our formula is now going to be a n equals a1, which is 7, plus n minus 1 times d. All right, so we can simplify this further, but um, if you follow the scoring guidelines, uh, this is how it was expressed as, okay? So if you do it this far, you should get uh, full credit. All right, let's take a look at problem 35. It said circle O shown below has a radius of 12 centimeters. Um, to the nearest tenth of a centimeter, determine the length of the arc X subtended by an angle of 83 degrees in 50 minutes. All right, so first of all, let's start by writing down the formula for arc length. So formula, formula, <clears throat> the arc length, if you think about it, the arc length is simply a percentage or a fraction of the entire circumference. What is the circumference of a circle? If you think back, circumference of a circle, circumference, um, is given by uh, 2 pi r, okay? So 2 pi r is the circumference of a circle. Now, arc length is simply a portion, a fraction of that circle. Remember, a full circle is 360. So if you want to find out the fraction of the um, circumference that you're calculating with the arc length, you're just going to divide the subtended angle by the entire angle. It tells you the fraction of the circle that you're collecting, okay? So that's why you write theta over 360. This gives you the fraction of the entire length, which is 2 pi r, okay? So the angle where 360, you're going to have the entire circle. If it were 180, Think about it, 180 is half of a full rotation, so you're going to be looking at half of the circumference. That will be the arc length. If it were 90 degrees, quarter of a circle. So the this ratio right here basically tells you the fraction of the entire circumference that you're looking for. All right, so just an easy way to remember it. In this situation, theta is 83 degrees and 50 minutes. Okay, um, some calculators can work with minutes. Others, you might have to convert it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this minutes to um, to decimal form, okay? So 50 minutes, look at this as hours. How many minutes do you have in an hour? You have 60 minutes in an hour, right? So you're going to write it as 83, 50 over 60 degrees. So let's reduce this. Cancel, cancel. Um, 5 divided by 6 is... Um, 0.83 repeating, so this becomes 83.83 repeating degrees. Um, so that's our angle, okay? And now our radius r is provided here. Uh, it's 12. So that's our radius. Now what we're going to do is we're going to plug this two arguments into a formula, okay? So our arc length, the arc length is... Um, 83.83 repeating over 360. This helps you calculate the fraction that you're taking of what? The fraction of the entire circumference, which is 2 pi times the radius of 12. All right? So how about we just let the calculator do the heavy lifting for us? So we're going to have um, parentheses 83.83. 8, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, divided by 360. That's a fraction of the circumference 2 pi times 12. Then I'm going to enter 17.558. 
So it's going to be approximately 17.558 centimeters. But the problem asks us to round it to the tenth of a centimeter, one decimal place. Okay. So um, to the tenth of a centimeter arc length is going to be uh, approximately 17.6 centimeters. All right, that's, that's our answer. All right, let's take a look at problem 36. Uh, this involves trig. It says solve algebraically for all exact values of x in the interval 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 2 pi. OK, so this is a combination of a quadratic equation and a trig equation. What we're going to do first is convert it into a quadratic equation. Now, do you see the quadratic equation within this problem? To make it obvious, we're going to make a substitution. Let, uh, what variable should we use? How about y? Let's y equal sine x. Okay, if y is sine x, what we're going to have is 2y squared plus 5y equals 3. What just happened, what we did is we took this sign right here and this sign and we replaced them with y's. All right, let's put this in standard form. It's 2y squared plus 5y. Subtract 3 from both sides, minus 3 equals 0. Now, this is a quadratic equation in standard form. All right, let's go ahead and solve it. We're going to use the x game and factoring by grouping here. So, AC goes on the top, B goes on the bottom. So, AC, B. Um, so A is 2, B is 5, C is negative 3. There's different ways you can solve an equation of this nature, but I like to do it by grouping uh, because it's very consistent. A C is negative 6, B is 5. This is a very tricky problem because if you think about all the um, pairs that multiply to give you 6, more than 1 can yield 5. Okay? Plus or minus 5. So for 6, we have 1 times 6 gives us 6, one mi uh, 6 minus 1 gives us 5, uh, 2 times 3 gives us 6, 2 plus 3 equals 5. So this is a very tricky problem. The cases where you have more than one combination that can yield the opposite um, or the exact value of b. So to figure out the right pair to use, we just want to think about what can yield negative 6 when you multiply any positive number um, upon addition. Okay, um, you just basically do a trial and error and see which one which one works. So let's try two and six, two and three first. Okay, let's say I wanted to try two and three. Um, let's see, two plus three, two times three is positive six, so the sign doesn't work. So th one of these two must be negative. Okay, so let's say three is negative, so the top works, but if one of them is negative, can I ever get a sum of positive five? The answer is no. The sum will always be smaller um, than 5. Okay, so that tells us that that combination doesn't work. So what do we do? We uh, take the next combination, 1 and 6, and hope that it works. Or else we have a prime situation, and we have to solve using the quadratic formula. Okay, so since this product is negative, that means one of these has to be negative. Since the sum is positive, that means the smaller has to be negative. So you see this works perfectly. So we're going to have 2y squared minus 1y. So let's make this black. Minus 1y. Actually, that was a better color to use. Minus 1y plus 6y minus 3 equals 0. Now, what did I just do? What I did is I took these two numbers that we found with our x game and I inserted them, replaced the middle term with those two numbers so I can factor by grouping, okay? So break it down the center uh, and then factor out the GCF from both pairs. So from the first two, I can take out y and I'll be left with 2y minus um, 1. From the next two, I can take out um, positive, always bring down the sign. I can take out a 3. So we have 2y minus 1 equals 0 also. Anytime you factor by grouping, the quantities in the parentheses must be identical. That's the case here, which is good. So we're going to take these two and factor them out since they're common. 
2y minus 1, and we're going to be left with y plus 3, okay? So times y plus 3 equals 0. All right, now let's uh, use the zero product property. We have 2y minus 1 equals 0, or y plus 3 equals 0. Now let's solve the first one. So for this one, we have 2y equals 1, y is equal to 1 half, and then for this one, y is equal to negative 3. So are these our answers? The answer is absolutely not. Remember, we made a substitution earlier. We said let y equal sine x. The problem asks us to solve for x, not y, okay? So we need to change our, our variables back. So for the first case, we're going to have sine y equals 1 half. And in the second case, sine, no, it's not sine y, sine x. Try that again. Sine x <laughs> equals 1 half. And the next one the second case, sine x equals negative 3. Now, which of these makes sense? If you think about your sine function, it has a constraint on its range. How high does a sine function go and how low does it go? Let's make a sketch real quick to refresh our memory. So sine starts from the center, it goes to the maximum, back to the center, to the minimum, back to the center. Okay, for just one complete period. In this problem, we're asked to go from 0 to 2 pi, okay? So um, there goes our sine function right there. There's our sine function. Okay, so this is 2 pi. Now the question is, uh, if it, the maximum is 1 and the minimum is negative 1, can sine ever attain a value of negative 3 somewhere down here? The answer is no. So this solution is extraneous. Okay, so this is not a valid solution. It's called extraneous. So we drop it. Now, can sine x have a value of one half? Absolutely, because one half is between these two values right here. Okay, so um, if sine x is equal to one half, x is going to be the inverse sine of one half. Now, anytime you take the inverse sine or cosine of a function, what you get is a reference angle, okay? So the inverse sine of 1 half is 30 degrees or pi over 6. Okay, so this is the reference angle. Now we need to look at the sine. Since sine x was positive here, that means that we have to consider all the quadrants with a reference angle of pi over 6 where sine is positive. Okay, so we know that all students take calculus take calculus, sine is positive in quadrant 1, so one acceptable response will be pi over 6. So there goes the first case. Remember your reference angle always starts from your closest x-axis to the terminal side. So there goes our first answer. Now where else is um, sine positive? Sine is also positive in quadrant 2. Okay, this is one of the reasons why we have the ambiguous case in a lot of science because when you take the inverse, you have more than one solution that can satisfy the interior angles of a triangle. So the reference angle here, do you can you see where the reference angle is going to be? The reference angle is going to be right here. Okay, that's pi over six, but that's not the angle of measure. The angle of measure, you always start measuring from zero. Okay, so this is zero, and we know this is pi. So if you take away pi over 6 from pi, what do you get? You get this angle of measure right here. Draw that again. You get this angle of measure right here, which is 5 pi over 6. So these are the two angular values that satisfy this equation right here. So um, we're going to have pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. Those are the two uh, values that satisfy our equation. So thanks so much for taking the time to watch this uh, presentation. Feel free to subscribe to our channel for updates to other cool clips such as this. And please post a comment to let us know what you think about this clip. We really appreciate it. More clips can be found on math.serve.com slash test prep. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.